last winter in Moscow. Thousands of people lined up in the middle of the night to be a part of an old ritual. The Russian soul, we're unbeatable. Our faith in God makes us strong. Something resembling a baptism for adults is taking place next to a church. The faithful take a quick dip in ice-cold water. During the Soviet era, this Russian Orthodox ritual to mark Epiphany all but disappeared. Now it's being revived. This is not just about faith. It's a way to show the world what Russia is capable of. Russian television is here to show President Vladimir Putin taking the plunge. 400 kilometers from Moscow, the man who serves as a role model for his country enters the chilly water. <laughs> this ritual unites Russians in different parts of the country. The faithful are impressed that their president is leading by example. A good Russian, a religious Russian, is faithful to his roots, his country, and the system in which he lives. We want to bring back these values and need someone to lead the way. And that's Vladimir Putin. Many things that were banned in the Soviet Union are now presented with pride, including Cossack traditions. Not far from Red Square are the offices of Tsargrad TV, a broadcaster that propagates a return to traditional values. Even in the lobby, it's clear who has the say here, the president and the patriarch of Moscow and all Russia. The broadcaster was founded by Konstantin Malofiev, an Orthodox businessman and Putin ally. Here, journalists criticize Western decadence and declare homosexuality to be a cardinal sin. Tsargrad TV's biggest star is host Andrei Afanasyev. That's our studio. Uh, it's considered one of the best and definitely well-equipped in Russia, and I'd say in the world. Uh, the main specialty of it is a hand-painted icon of uh, uh, Jesus Pentecrator. Uh, it's one of, one of the symbols of our channel. In 2017, Andrei Afanasyev made international headlines when he produced a video offering Russian homosexuals a free one-way ticket to the U.S. This is not a joke. We really want you to move there, where you can openly submit to your sins. Sargrad TV says these kinds of pieces have increased viewer numbers substantially. The broadcaster claims a quarter of all Russians have watched its programs at least once. I'm Andrei Afanasyev. Welcome to the Russian Answer. The programs fight for family values and against abortion. And they depict the West as decadent and corrupt. These are also favorite topics of owner Konstantin Malofiev. The 45-year-old business tycoon amassed his wealth through banking and internet companies. People call him the orthodox oligarch, though he sees himself as a monarchist. He's also said to be in direct contact with Vladimir Putin. Putin, in my eyes, definitely good substitute for the Tsar for this moment. Definitely. Because what he's doing right now, it would be the best what, what could be done by born Tsar. He personifies himself with Russia. 
To pass this sense of patriotism and orthodoxy onto the next generation, Konstantin Malafiev has also founded a school. The St. Basil the Great School is located in an upscale neighborhood in Moscow. 400 pupils attend classes in what resembles a palace. The school is a training ground for Russia's future elites. The walls are lined with images of past czars and famous Russian writers, constant reminders of the pre-revolutionary Russian Empire. The point was, uh, of course, you know, for children to uh, you know, watch these paintings. Uh, and it's, it's given something to your heart and to your mind, even if you are not mentioned this. Uh, deeply in your mind, you always would remember, you know, something good, nice, you know, and back to Russian history. To make sure nothing distracts from this special atmosphere, cell phones aren't allowed at the St. Basil the Great School. For just over 1,000 euros a month, even young children get to learn all about tradition, including Church Slavonic, which is still used in Orthodox services. Do you like Church Slavonic? <laughs> Along with a classical education, pupils are also taught good manners, proper etiquette, and dancing. Fifteen-year-old Barbara is the daughter of an oil company CEO. She's attended the school for four years. We're not too bad. Proceed and turn. This traditional dance was very popular in the 19th century. We're practicing it for our school's anniversary celebrations when our parents and many other guests will be here. Celebrated in the style of the imperial era, the ball is one of the highlights of the school year. Barbara will also dance before the watchful eyes of school founder Konstantin Malafiev. I'll admit, I'm a bit nervous. But after the dress rehearsal, there will be less stress. And at the ball, I'll be much better. Barbara lives in an exclusive residential area not far from the school, with her parents and her younger brother. Her room is decorated with Russian icons. But recently, Barbara has also been learning to play the guitar and her walls are also covered with posters of rock bands, which aren't on the curriculum at the St. Basil the Great School. I'm a completely normal teenager. I listen to alternative rock, like uh, Ramstein, Three Days Grace, and Green Day. And there's Imagine Dragons and My Chemical Romance. She made the rainbow flags, which symbolize the LGBT pride movement, herself. <laughs> My parents don't know what these colors mean. At school, they tell us that homosexuality is something bad. But I think that all people are equal. Even if someone has black skin or a different sexual orientation, they should be respected and loved. This evening, Barbara's parents are hosting a dinner party. Her father, Andre, is cooking a specialty from Siberia, where he grew up. Это... This is Siberian sturgeon, the favorite dish of people in the north. We lived in the north for 40 years. My parents moved there in their youth, in the days when it was still the Soviet Union. Andre trained as a geologist. 
He worked for an oil company and rose through the ranks until he became its CEO. Now he belongs to the Russian elite. Delicious. Barbara's mother Anastasia is also preparing a Siberian specialty. Siberian pelmeni, dumplings filled with ground meat and onions. Russians love them. Another married couple and Barbara's grandparents have been invited for dinner. And of course, there's lots to drink. I wish you luck and love. We're glad you're here. In Russia, it's a tradition to say a toast before drinking another glass. I drink to your big family. May it remain united. That's what's most valuable. <laughs> and that you honor tradition, to you. Thanks. We've known each other so long. <laughs> Maybe these Russians are so focused on tradition because their recent history has been so chaotic. For many, change breeds fear. In Russian history, every major change has led to violence. We've always had bloody revolutions and coups, with many deaths and lives shattered. Here, they're all Putin supporters, mainly because Russia has enjoyed sustained economic growth during his rule. Since 1999, the average income has increased tenfold. Today, we have more faith in the future. The country has stabilized. We feel protected in every way. You can make money legally. Stability is the most important thing. But Putin doesn't just have the wealthy upper class behind him. He can also rely on the support of a legendary Slavic people known for their courage and fighting skills, the Cossacks. Their troops on horseback once defended Russia's borders and spread fear among opponents and religious minorities. Rostov on Don in southern Russia is the center of Don Cossack culture. Grigory is 15 years old. His father and his grandfather were Cossacks. His life's aim is to defend his homeland. Everyone must decide if he's a patriot or not. Today, Russia is subject to many dangers from abroad. Should I have to defend my motherland one day, I'm even prepared to sacrifice my life. Grigory has already internalized the Cossack values of patriotism, militarism, and orthodoxy. It's a mixture that matches Vladimir Putin's conservative ideals. Grigory is a cadet at the highly regarded Shakti Cossack school. Here, 220 young men are preparing for their military service. Hail the flags of the Russian Federation and the Rostov region. In Soviet times, Cossacks were oppressed. After the Iron Curtain collapsed, their culture began to flourish again. Putin officially integrated them into the Russian army. This school is publicly funded. I expect our president to hold the country together and ensure our welfare. Today, his most important duty is the security of our country, and he must see to it that there is peace in our nation, because what's happening at our borders frightens us. Grigory and his fellow pupils have the same curriculum as in other Russian schools. They study everything from math to literature. But here there's a special focus on history, 
specifically the history of the Cossacks. For Cossacks, your head covering is a question of honor. Our forefathers only removed it to pray when they entered a church or were communing with God. When a Cossack died on the battlefield, he was never buried with his cap. It was always brought to his widow. Along with the uniforms and weapons, pupils are also told about their forefathers' heroic deeds. Grigory and his friends are proud of these stories. Cossacks played a key role in almost all the wars. They were the first to go into battle. It's because of them that Russia was so powerful. So at the school, they also put theory into practice. They reenact historical battles to internalize heroic feats from bygone days. Cadets, come here. For school director Vitali, it's an indispensable exercise. What we've read isn't enough. We have to put on the uniforms of our forefathers and use their weapons and march for kilometers in the same conditions. We have to withstand cold and snowstorms. That's the only way to learn our history. After an hour of drills and temperatures of minus 15 degrees Celsius, the Cossack students can finally warm up. But before they eat, they have to pray. I want to share this adventure with my comrades, and if they ever need me, I'll help them out. I feel connected to them, and perhaps we'll later serve in the same regiment. The older students are doing bodybuilding. Their big role model is Vladimir Putin. Is Putin a strong man for you? Yes, he has a strong character. He's physically and mentally strong. He's even a martial arts master. That's how he can lead a country of 150 million people. Only he can help our country advance and develop. I don't see anyone who can equal him or replace him as president. Like every weekend, Grigory is packing his things. Tomorrow he's going home. It's a 200-kilometer trip. He lives in a small town of some 8,000 people, in this house. I missed you so much. I missed you too. Grigori's parents are divorced. His mother, Yelena, works in a medical lab and earns around 300 euros a month. When her son comes home, she lets him sleep in the only bed. That's my brother. He's a soldier in a special forces unit. He's my role model. That's what a real man and soldier should be like. Yelena does worry about her boys, but her love for her country is paramount. 
The most important thing is that my sons defend our nation. They must be prepared to sacrifice themselves for their comrades if necessary. I've raised my sons to be real men. She thinks Putin is a good president. He supports the revival of orthodoxy and has had many churches built. For us Cossacks, that's important. Since Putin has been in power, the Russian Orthodox Church has enjoyed a noticeable revival. In the last two decades, around a thousand churches have been restored or rebuilt each year. Many were destroyed during Stalin's rule. Since 2011, 65 churches have been erected in Moscow alone. Another 150 are in the planning. The idea is for every Muscovite to have a house of worship with an easy reach. The Moscow Patriarchate has even been offered the city's green spaces as building sites. A conflict has erupted between residents and church leaders over the Tofyanka Park in northern Moscow. On the one side are priests and the faithful who are staking their claim by holding regular masses here. On the other side are angry locals who don't want to lose their park. Ah, привет, привет. Natasha is the group's spokeswoman. For two years, she's been fighting to have the construction stopped, or at least postponed. There are already four churches in this district. This would be the fifth. Why do they have to destroy the park when there are already so many? Recently, Natasha and her friends were attacked by a group of thugs. I was punched in the head. They gave me a black eye and broke my brow bone. Because I filed a police report, I received threats. We'll kill you in the name of our faith. Other protesters were beaten up too. But to date, the police have stood idly by. I want to ask you, many of us were attacked and injured by SS-type thugs, yet nothing was done about it. Why? The group, which calls itself 40 times 40, is protected by the authorities. It acts on behalf of the Orthodox Church. The name 40 times 40 refers to the 1,600 churches that were said to exist in Moscow before the revolution. Former hooligans and martial artists comprise this armed wing of the Orthodox Church. The group holds President Putin in high esteem and claims to act in Russia's interest. These scenes show 40 times 40s violent intervention at Torfeyanka Park. In their own way, they demonstrate the growing power of the Russian Orthodox Church. We meet members of the group. One of its leaders, Artyom, invited us to a church. In the basement, they're practicing martial arts. Beforehand, they also pray here. Welcome. <laughs> Come, line up to pray. The group is comprised of a colorful mix of students, police officers, and IT experts like Artyom. Twice a week they gather here to train after work. So, let's go. And keep moving. Artyom tells us that to defend their conservative faith, they need to be physically fit. 
Our emblem is a bogatyr, an Orthodox knight who defends the Russian Church with a sword and a shield. Orthodoxy and our country are important to us. During the Soviet era, such emblems were forbidden. Now they're being used to win the faithful respect. We have to protect our members and our cathedrals. If someone attacks us or makes fun of holy things, then we have to try to defend them. We must defend them. Over time, 40 times 40 have made themselves indispensable. We're taking on more and more duties. At first, we only defended holy sites. Now we also help at the Patriarch's church services. On the same evening, 40 times 40 will be on duty at a ceremonial mass attended by then Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev. The Cathedral of Christ the Savior, Moscow's largest cathedral, is heavily guarded. Only invited guests are allowed in. This is the invitation. You need it to get in. Where I got it, that's a secret. He used to work here. Artyom and his friends don't need an invitation. Around a dozen people from their group are in attendance. <laughs> Officially, they're here as stewards. <laughs> the cathedral is full of security personnel. The church service is being transmitted live on television. Then Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev has come to hear Patriarch Kirill's sermon in person. For Artyom, Medvedev's presence is a good omen. Our best times were always when political power and the church were united. As long as this alliance lasts, nothing can happen to us. Medvedev was here to represent Vladimir Putin, who was attending a celebration in St. Petersburg. We Christians like it that Putin is an Orthodox believer. He supports the Church, and that's very valuable. In spite of their violent methods, Artyom and his friends are welcome here. 40 times 40 enjoys the support of the Church, and likely that of the authorities, too. At least that's the opinion of the demonstrators protesting against the construction of the church in Moscow's Torfianka Park. The attacks against them were never investigated, and Natasha and Yevgeny have been targeted again and again. In the middle of the night, we suddenly heard someone sawing at our door. My husband opened it, and 15 masked men stormed in and pointed their guns at us. Several special units were involved in searching our house, including the Secret Service. They were all after us. Yevgeny and eight other activists each received unwelcome visitors who were accompanied by TV crews. Clearly, these home searches were meant to serve as warnings.
But since Yevgeny began receiving death threats over the internet, he now fears for his life. One guy from 40 times 40 wrote that he's digging a grave for me in the park and that he plans to bury me there. When I went to the police, they said, come back when you're dead. But death threats are no laughing matter in Russia. Journalists, lawyers and politicians have all been victims of deadly attacks. Many still remember the assassination of opposition politician Boris Nemtsov, just steps from the Kremlin. Nemtsov served as deputy prime minister of Russia under Boris Yeltsin. He later criticized the corruption under Vladimir Putin. The funeral procession for Nemtsov turned into a protest march against Putin. But the Russian president denied any responsibility for the killing. Ilya, a 52-year-old engineer, wants to make sure the murder isn't forgotten. I wrote a poem for Nemtsov. Your reward for telling the truth was getting hit with four bullets. Like Boris Nemtsov, Ilya hoped that post-communist Russia would develop into a democratic society. He's never belonged to a political party, Nemtsov's included. But he's protesting against what he views as a politically motivated murder. There are people at the top who can contract their subordinates to murder opposition leaders. Today we're governed by terrorists. Once a week, Ilya holds a night-long vigil. His daughter and son-in-law worry about him. I've come back safe and sound each time. You say that, and then you call us from the police station to come get you. True. I know the police department well. Exactly. And that's not the only danger. Just one minute to go. Nemtsov was murdered at 11.31 p.m. They observe a minute of silence in front of the walls of the Kremlin. Heroes don't die. A few passers-by stop to express their support. He was killed because he was against... against Putin. It's, uh, well, very clear. And everybody knows who killed him, except uh, our judges. That's a very sad story, very sad story for our country. Five Chechens acting as contract killers were jailed, but there's been no investigation into who ordered the hit. I'm not absolutely sure that I'm in safe when I speak with you. The site is cleaned very often to drive would-be protesters away. Ilya and his friends take turns guarding the memorial. 
seven days a week, around the clock. Time and again, their vigil has been attacked by ultra-nationalists. One of them struck down Olga's husband. A man came up to Ivan and asked, you don't like Putin? Ivan answered, why should I like him? Then the man hit him and ran off. Ivan was taken to the hospital, where he died of heart failure. Since then, his wife has attended the vigil on her own. Less than three years after Nemtsov's assassination, another opposition politician was prevented from taking part in the Russian presidential elections. Protesters chanted, down with Putin. Alexei Navalny made a name for himself, blogging against corruption. He planned to challenge Putin in the 2018 election, but was barred from running due to a conviction for alleged embezzlement. Navalny is convinced the Kremlin leadership fears him. At this rally, Navalny was arrested and held for eight hours. Authorities said the rally hadn't been approved. Navalny's supporters were furious and chanted, Russia without Putin. He's like a devil here because he destroyed our country. Russia without Putin. Down with the Tsar. Today, Putin is the new Tsar. What else can you call someone who's been in power for almost 20 years? Russia has degenerated into nothing more than a feudal country that's ruled with bayonets, clubs, and crosses. Ivan is just 16. He'd love to vent his anger in front of the windows of the Kremlin, but hundreds of police officers are blocking the way. Unfortunately, Putin's won again today. There aren't enough of us. During his 19 years in power, Vladimir Putin has eliminated his most dangerous opponents. His United Russia party holds close to three quarters of the seats in the state Duma. One of Putin's most faithful MPs is Vitaly Milonov. He's the architect of Russia's gay propaganda law, which has cost many LGBT teachers their jobs. So it means that you cannot address yourself to an infant saying that uh, uh, that sodomy, sodomy is a normal way of life. That's what absolutely shared by vast majority of Russians. So we put this uh, tradition into legislation. The gay propaganda law was passed almost unanimously with just one abstention. The European Court of Human Rights has ruled it discriminatory. Malonov comes from St. Petersburg. The former Russian capital is also the birthplace of Vladimir Putin. Long known as Russia's window to the West, St. Petersburg is home to many sexual minorities. 
but gay bars aren't recognizable from the outside. They don't advertise or fly rainbow flags. In a modest apartment on the edge of the city lives a man who is waging his own personal war on homosexuals. He's a jeweler by day, but at night he takes on the role of a criminal investigator. He tracks down LGBT teachers using the internet. If I see teachers on a gay or lesbian website, then I find out where they work and contact the interior ministry. Then legal action is taken against them, though sometimes they just quit on their own. Timur doesn't require much evidence. One photo on the net is enough. Look at this music teacher. She's pictured here with her girlfriend. They're clearly lesbian, and pupils can see that. She published all her photos. Now she's been fired. She even went abroad to escape the pressure. Timur claims he's caused 70 educators to be sacked so far. Due to his activities, he's now barred from entering the U.S. and the E.U. Meanwhile, in the ritzy area of Moscow where Barbara lives, her family is looking forward to the school ball. Her mother has hired a hairdresser to make sure Barbara shines in front of Putin's friends. I'm very excited about uh, this prom. And uh, yeah, it's like a dream when a princess came to the prom and uh, it's like a, my child dream, so. But whilst the revival of a czarist Russia may be a dream for some, for others, it's a complete nightmare.